Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever, it, wherever you're watching us from, whatever time it is that you're joining us uh, for our time of worship. We're so glad that you're able to join us. My name is Pastor James Mushai. I'm one of the pastors at Mavuno Church. I have the privilege of serving in the Mavuno Church Hill City Campus in Athi River, just outside of Nairobi in Kenya. And I have the privilege of bringing to us God's word uh, this month. I'm going to start us off with a story. You know, the story is told of a newlywed couple. Uh, you know, they were just settling into marriage and, you know, this, this new husband was really excited and he loved his wife. And one day he comes home and he comes home with a, you know, with a big chunk of ham that he had bought. He knew uh, that his wife loved ham and so he's bought it. Uh, I think maybe he was from the same place I'm from where men express love by uh, bringing food for their wives to cook. And so he brings this big chunk of ham home and, and, and you know, he presents it to his wife. And the first thing he, she does is, you know, she cuts off and chops off the corners and the edges of the ham, throws them into the bin and, and puts it into the fridge. And you know, he's a really little shocked, he's, he's, in, he's in horror and he doesn't know what's just happened but he's still a new husband so you know, he, he chills down and he says, okay, I'm not going to have this conversation right now. But unfortunately, he sees it happen a second time and a third time and finally he just, he just had to bring it up. And, and, and so he asks her, why, why do you you know, don't you think that's being wasteful? Why do you cut off the edges of the ham and throw it out and then put the rest in the fridge? And her response was simple. She said, that's how you're supposed to, to do it. That's how you're supposed to store ham. And he insisted that that's not how you're supposed to do it. And they got into a little back and forth. And eventually they came to a very good conclusion that she was going to ask her mom why it is that that was what she did uh, because she had learned it from her mother. And so she called her mom and she says, mom, please tell, tell him that this is how you're supposed to store ham. And by the way, why do we do it that way anyway? I realized that I never asked you. And so she, you know, her mom pauses on the phone a little bit and she says to her, you know what? I actually don't know. I learned it from my mother. And so, you know, she, she says, okay, that's all right. I'll call grandma, uh, you know, and uh, you know, I haven't caught up with her in a while anyway. And I'll ask her why she taught you to do that. And so she called her grandma and she says, mom taught me to always cut the edges off the ham before I store it in the refrigerator. But I just realized that I don't know why we do it. Why do we do it, grandma? And to her shock, her grandma burst out laughing. And she told her, told her an interesting story. She says, I can't believe you still do that. She says, when I was newly married, you know, we had a really small fridge in our house. And so when your grandpa brought ham home, you know, I sort of had to trim off the edges so that it could fit in the fridge. But you no longer need to do that because your fridge is big enough that your ham can fit in it. You no longer need to do that. And obviously this outcome helps the new, new uh, you know, the new marriage. And, and one can only hope that this young man had the wisdom to not tell his wife, I told you so. You see, what had happened to the young lady and to her mother is that they had interacted with and adopted a ritual, uh, you know, from the grandma, the purpose of which they hadn't quite understood. And rituals are part of a reality of our life. And, and they're just, you know, there are many rituals as we sort of find ourselves into. We are starting a new sermon series today. Our sermon series is called Relentless Pursuit. Relentless Pursuit. And we're talking about prayer. And we're going to be looking at five pursuits of prayer. Uh, uh, and essentially, the question we'll be asking is, what's our goal? What's the thing we are pursuing as we enter into a space of prayer? What are we hoping to do? What are we hoping to accomplish or to achieve? And today, I'm going to talk about two rituals of prayer. I'm going to distinguish uh, between the two of them, and then we'll look at the, uh, the, the next three over the next uh, three weeks. The first ritual that we'll talk about, the first um, Pursuit of prayer is prayer in pursuit of ritual. Ritual is the first pursuit of prayer. What do I mean when I talk about prayer in pursuit of ritual? What this means is, uh, it's when I pray because prayer is what I do. That somewhere along the way in my life, I adopted a ritual of prayer. I learned that in certain circumstances, when certain things happen, that the, my response, the, the response that's expected out of me or from me is prayer. And so I pray because that's what I'm supposed 
to do. Many of us have a ritual of some sort or the other that we have adopted from, my family, from our families. Let me share uh, one, one ritual that we had as a family growing up. You know, my mom taught us as, uh, you know, as the children, myself and my siblings, that in the morning you needed to pray and start your day with prayer. And you started your day with a specific prayer, and that was the Lord's Prayer. And so the first thing we did when we woke up, the first thing I did when I woke up was I said the Lord's Prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and I said the prayer to the end. Another ritual that she taught us was that the last thing you do, you have to pray before you sleep, but not just pray, but there's a specific prayer, and that prayer is what we call the, the, you know, we say the words of the grace, and so when I got into bed before I fell asleep, the last thing I did was say, you know, and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Those are rituals that I adopted from my family of origin, and that's how I prayed for many of my early years years as I was growing up. I started every morning with the Lord's Prayer. I ended every day with the words of the grace. What rituals do you remember from your family growing up? For many families, there are rituals of praying together, praying together in the morning or in the evening or both, praying together before we eat, praying together before we start a a road trip, Uh, different kinds of rituals that we have all sort of experienced and gone through as we have grown up that we often find become a part of who we are. Ritual is the first pursuit of prayer, and it is prayer to check a box or to fulfill an expectation. What does it look like if your prayer life is defined primarily by a pursuit of ritual? If your prayer is founded and based mostly or even exclusively on a desire to, you know, to fulfill a ritual? I want to share with us a number of things, three things that could go wrong when our prayer is only in pursuit of ritual, when it is not in pursuit of anything other than ritual. And the first thing is this, a lack of of understanding, that when I pray only in pursuit of ritual, often my prayer life will be marked by a lack of understanding. You know, I don't understand why I need to be here praying, but I'll do it because so and so said I must. It's what I was taught, that how, this is how I was told I ought to behave. You know, hopefully as we go through this series, we will grow in understanding, even starting from today, uh, as we learn more and more about prayer. So the first challenge about praying exclusively in pursuit of ritual is that there is a lack of understanding. And the second thing is that there can be a lack of passion, and often there is, because you do not understand why it is that you're engaging in this activity. You can engage in it without conviction and without passion, because the value of the activity is not clear to you. The third challenge that I see in praying in pursuit of ritual alone is that you can find yourself in a place that is that, that, that I have had called a place of ritual without reality. Ritual without reality. What does this mean? This means that I pray not out of devotion, but out of compulsion. I pray not out of devotion, but out of compulsion. For those of us who went, you know, to religious schools of some form or the other, we may have experienced this, that part of the regime of the school, uh, you know, our daily and weekly routines were marked with prayer at certain times. And so we engaged with them, but sometimes it was more, you know, the teacher said so, the matron or the, or, you know, the principal said so, and so this is what we do. So there's a ritual that we are exercising, but there's no devotion and a uh, 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 sort of connected to it. So our first pursuit that I want you to sort of highlight, and and I'm talking about two pursuits today, uh, is is prayer in pursuit of ritual. The the second pursuit of prayer, it looks, you know, almost similar. It, It looks kind of like almost identical to prayer in pursuit of ritual, but has some significant differences. And this is what I want to talk about today, and it is prayer as a rhythm. The the pursuit here is to align my life or to establish in my life a rhythm of prayer. Prayer in pursuit of rhythm or prayer as a rhythm. And my invitation to you today is that you will make prayer a critical part of your life rhythms, your, your daily rhythm, your weekly rhythm, your monthly rhythm, that prayer will be at the center of your rhythms. That will be my invitation to you today. And I'm going to share with you two powerful reasons that I have found in the scriptures uh, that, that sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of speak to me and show me why it is important that I have a rhythm of prayer established into my life. 
I'm going to give you two reasons from the scriptures, but before we get into that, I want to uh, sort of respond a little bit to the challenges of prayer in pursuit of ritual. I find... You know, I'll I'll mention them again, that number one, there's a lack of understanding. Number two, there's a lack of passion. Number three, we find ourselves in a place of ritual without reality. When prayer is a rhythm rather than a ritual, these three challenges are resolved because your life rhythm is a choice. That's how they are resolved. Because now there's no, it's not out of compulsion alone. It's not out of an expectation from an external authority. You have chosen this as a rhythm of your life, which means you have answered the question. You understand why you need the rhythm. There's passion and commitment because you're choosing the rhythm. And, and, and you know, it's not just a ritual without reality because you're entering into this place willingly. So that's the most significant difference that I see between, you know, prayer in pursuit of ritual and prayer as a rhythm, is that when it's a rhythm, you have chosen that path and you have chosen that journey. I want us to jump into our reading for today uh, as we look closer at this pursuit of prayer, uh, 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 which is prayer as a rhythm. We'll be reading from the book of Luke, chapter 22. And this chapter records the night that Jesus was arrested before, you know, and he goes through this mock trial before his uh, torture and crucifixion. And it has one of the most significant illustrations, I believe, of prayer in the scriptures. We're going to read from verse 39 to verse 45 of Luke, chapter 22. And here's what it says. Then, accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Verse 43 continues, Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep. Remember the disciples were about a stone's throw away from where Jesus was praying. So again, he he, he returned to the disciples only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. That's verse 45 of Luke chapter 22. Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. The first thing that I want to draw out, the first lesson that I want to point out to you in this portion of scripture is that prayer was a rhythm in Jesus' life. That's the thing I see On this evening, Jesus is about to be arrested. And verse 39 tells us that Jesus went as usual to the Mount of Olives, as usual. It wasn't his first time. It wasn't his second time. It was a regular occurrence in his life. In other words, in Jesus' life was firmly established a rhythm of regular, consistent, and diligent prayer. I could find about 25 instances in the Gospels of Jesus praying. Six of those instances make it clear that he was praying in private, that he had gone away and separated himself from the crowds and even from his disciples so he could be alone as he spent time in prayer. A number of those instances refer to Jesus praying early in the morning, uh, you know, sort of receding away from the crowd, going to a solitary place. And it makes it clear that Jesus had in his life a rhythm of prayer. So when the Bible says Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives as usual and then he invited his disciples to come up with him, it is very clear to me that this was a rhythm in Jesus' life. He was in the habit of praying regularly. I said that I'll share with you two reasons why you need to have prayer established as a critical and an important rhythm in your life. And the first reason is this, Jesus did it and so should you. Jesus did it and so should I. If Jesus had this rhythm in his life, if Jesus is my example, then I too should have, uh, you know, prayer as one of my critical rhythms as I go through my life. That's the first reason why I need to engage in this pursuit of prayer. Prayer as a rhythm in my life is that Jesus did it and so should I. The second thing that I see in this lesson is that rhythms establish habits and become, that become foundations. Allow me to say that again. Rhythms establish habits that become 
foundations. Listen, you know, what do I mean by this? How do you respond? Let me ask you a question. How do you respond to major events in your life? Every now and then in our lives, we experience major event, a significant thing happens to us. And this could be, you know, this could be significant positive events that I get a big promotion or I get a big deal that goes through for my company and I'm going to earn enough money. It's going to change my life forever. It could be, you know, uh, um, you know that I've gotten uh, into a relationship. I've gotten married. We've gotten our first child. There's this huge blessing, this huge, amazing thing that has come our way. What happens in my life when that major event happens? It could be a negative event, especially moments of deep loss, the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a marriage, the loss of a child. That's a major significant event that brings significant pain and loss into our lives. How do you respond to such events? In those moments, the things that keep us anchored that keep us anchored are the things that have been firmly established as rhythms in our lives. Those are the things that survive the storm, whether it's a positive thing that has changed our lives or a negative thing that has brought pain. It is the rhythms that we have established that sort of keep us going. Mark chapter 14 records this same story. Listen to what Mark, Mark, the book of Mark says, uh, chapter 14, verse 33 and 34. He took, Jesus, uh, he took Peter, James, and John with him. It's talking about Jesus. And he became deeply troubled and distressed. He's speaking about Jesus. He was deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. That's Jesus describing what's going on with him in that moment, that his soul was crushed with grief even to the point of death. And then he says to them, stay here and keep watch with me. So Jesus was deeply troubled and distressed and then he testifies himself that his soul was crushed with grief. His response in that moment was to do his usual thing. It was to go away and spend some time in prayer. At his time of deepest grief, at his time of greatest anxiety and pain, his response was that he went to his usual place to do his usual thing which was to pray because he had a rhythm of prayer firmly established in his life. How do you keep going when you don't feel like praying? How do you pray when you're deeply, deeply disappointed with God because you feel he let you down because there's a prayer you desperately needed him to answer, but he didn't answer? How do you keep going at that point? How do you keep praying when you no longer need to because the thing you have been, you are desperate for has come through, the prayer has been answered, the miracle has happened? How do you maintain your intimacy with God and your relationship with God? How do you keep that going after the prayer has been answered and so you no longer need to pray? The way you keep that going is by establishing and maintaining rhythms by establishing a rhythm of prayer because rhythms establish habits that become foundations. Rhythms establish habits that become foundations and those foundations anchor us when our lives are shaken in one way or the other. I want to illustrate this a little further by looking at the disciples. Listen to what it said in Luke chapter 22 verse, verse 45. At last he stood up again and returned to the disciples only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Listen to this. Jesus said, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death in Mark. And then Luke tells us that the disciples were exhausted with grief. Both Jesus and the disciples were grieving deeply. What was their response? It was overwhelming for Jesus so he prayed. It was overwhelming for the disciples, so they slept. You see, Jesus had established in his life a rhythm of prayer. And, and, and rhythms become, you know, uh, rhythms establish habits that become foundations. The foundation was there so that in this moment that shook his world, Jesus responded by going before the Lord in prayer. Jesus was overwhelmed. He prayed. The disciples were overwhelmed. By the same thing, grief, they slept. Jesus' response was to enter into a, a place of having a conversation with his father in his moment of anguish. 
Rhythms establish habits that become foundations. The only way to, for you to find strength when, when a major event has happened that has shaken you to the core is if you establish a rhythm of prayer in your life. That's how you keep going in spite of feeling deep disappointment because God did not come through for you as you have, had hoped. When God has blessed you and you no longer need to wake up early in the morning and fast and pray for an answer because the answer has come through, the rhythm is the thing that keeps you anchored and investing in your intimacy with God through prayer and it keeps your relationship going because you weren't just praying because you needed something, you are praying because there's a rhythm and, and prayer is a rhythm that is a central part of your life. Rhythms establish habits that become foundations, and those foundations define us in our most significant moments. If there is a rhythm established in my life that I pray at 4.30 every morning, then I pray on the day when I feel like it, and I pray on the day that I don't feel like it. I pray at 4.30 in the morning on the day when I'm winning and I'm crushing it, on the day when yesterday I had a great high because God came through because I won in my work or in my family and this amazing thing happened to me and I wake up at 4.30 and I pray when I'm winning. But even when I'm struggling, when I'm, when I'm broken and I'm wounded and, and something significantly difficult has come my way, I wake up at 4.30 in the morning and I pray because prayer is my rhythm. It's not just a thing I do once in a while. It's a rhythm that is a part of my life. That's why you need to establish prayer as a rhythm in your life. You see, we often, too often we allow our, lives to, our prayer lives to be defined by how we feel. Do I feel like praying today? If I do, I will. Maybe if I don't, then I don't pray. And if this is the trajectory that you're on, if your prayer life is defined by your feeling today in this moment, do I feel like waking up? Do I feel like rising up out of my bed or do I not? If that's what it's defined by, then it is very likely that prayer will go out the window the moment a major event comes your way, whether it is positive or it is negative. Prayer as a rhythm prepares us for those defining moments of victory or of pain, and it helps us stay anchored. Many of us probably know people who lost their relationship with God, who, who went out of their walk of faith because they had a big win and God blessed them, and they slowly drifted away, or even very quickly after the blessing, they drifted away. But we also know people who lost their faith because something significantly difficult and painful happened, and they couldn't keep in, stay in their walk with God. They couldn't keep praying. They couldn't keep seeking God. They couldn't bring that pain and brokenness like Jesus did. He comes before the Lord with his difficulty. He comes before the Lord on his most difficult night here on earth. He brings his pain to the Lord because he had a rhythm of prayer established in his life. It is critical that every follower of Jesus observe prayer as a rhythm firmly established in their lives. And the two reasons are simple, and I see them clearly demonstrated from this portion of scripture in Luke chapter 22. The first reason is this, Jesus did it, and so should I. This is the example that our Lord Jesus set for us, and we ought to follow in that example. The second reason is that rhythm, rhythms establish habits that become foundations. Rhythm keeps us going through the highs and the lows of life. As I bring this to a close, I want to invite you to two rhythms that, 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 that you need to establish or that are, a, that are a place to start for you and your family as you get into this space of establishing rhythm, prayer as a rhythm in your life. The first is our morning prayers. Every morning from Monday to Friday uh, in, our different, in the different networks of the different Mavuno churches, we come and gather together at 4.30, from 4.30 to 5.30 on Zoom. If you haven't been attending those prayers, then my invitation to you is that you will make this a rhythm that you pursue consistently, faithfully, and diligently. 
that you will make this a significant and major rhythm in your life, that you will commit to attend these prayers. Maybe you're watching this and you sort of atten- have been attending these prayers when you feel like it, you've been attending these prayers when, when you know you're not too tired or too sleepy or you didn't have a late night. My invitation to you is that you will make this a critical rhythm for your life, that the time you sleep in the evening will be defined by the fact that you recognize you need to be at prayers the following morning, every Monday to Friday, 4.30 to 5.30 on Zoom is when we have our morning prayers. The second rhythm I want to invite you to is a more personal rhythm. Maybe you don't have what we call a family altar, which is a rhythm of prayer for you and your family or your household, wherever you live. And my invitation for you is that you will establish a rhythm of prayer for your family as well. Whether it is to pray in the morning or whether it is to pray in the evening, if you're married with your spouse, if you have children with your spouse and your children, that you will sit together and consistently, regularly, diligently, daily even, that you will spend some time together in prayer. Part of what this does, and, and it will do for you, part of what it's done for me, especially as a parent, is that it starts to establish this rhythm in the lives of my children. Because even as I'm attempting, as I'm seeking to establish prayer as a, as a rhythm in my life, I desire that it will be established as a rhythm in the lives of my children. So this is the, pursuit, the first pursuit of prayer that I'm inviting you into this month. It is prayer as a rhythm, that you will make it a critical part of your life, that it will be at the center of your planning for your time, that you will say, where is my prayer time? I will show up at 4.30 and spend 4.30 to 5.30 in prayer. I will spend time with my family praying at the time that works and the time we can make most consistent. And I know that as these rhythms are established, we will be living like Jesus because we say, that Jesus had a rhythm. Jesus did it, and so should I. And secondly, the rhythms will establish habits that will become foundations for you in your life. Let me pray for you. Our Father and our King, we thank you that you invite us into a life of prayer, that this invitation is is, is to a privilege of entering your presence, of seeking your face, of communing with you. I pray over every single person watching this that you will give us the grace to establish a a rhythm of prayer in our lives, that our lives will be marked by prayer, that at the center of our planning, at the center of our prioritizing for our days, O God, will be prayer to the glory and honor of your name, that, Lord, you will establish firm foundations in our lives, O God, that will help us keep seeking you, keep investing in our work with you, keep coming before you in prayer, even in the most difficult and most challenging moments. I thank you that even as we come before you in prayer, you will continually bless us and that you will do exceedingly abundantly above everything we can think, ask, or even imagine. In Jesus' name we have prayed. God bless you. God bless you.